In this video, we're gonna cover how to get your business to run without you, to where even if you wanted to, your business really could become an asset that produces income independent of your time. So for context, we scaled to, or you know, I'll just say last year, 2022, we finished a little bit above 30 million, so about 31, 32 million. And a big reason we were able to do that is I was able to build up a lot of leaders in the organization so I could buy back my time to the point where I could really focus on the things that move the needle forward. And we're even to a point now where if I really, really wanted to within the next three or four months, I could just really exit the company altogether, still obviously own the company, but have great leaders who really run the company for me. So this video is gonna share with you the process that I've learned that builds those leaders, builds sales managers, client success directors, really the process that even built our CEOs that really run the day-to-day -day operations companies now, and all of that stuff to where if you're a business owner, you can use this same process to buy back your time and really get your business to the point where it runs without you. So let's dive in. This training is called Promoting and Managing Leaders Within Your Company. What we're gonna cover is the three-step process of bringing up leaders within the company, compensation, I'm gonna give you some examples, responsibilities, and uh, how to develop the leaders once you have them. So as an overview, you could really do this in two ways. You could either acquire and develop the talent in-house, so bring up people internally, or you can buy the talent. So in the sense where you're building it in-house, the first thing you wanna do is acquire the talent yourself, right? Now, this might be you as the founder or the CEO, or maybe you're somebody different in the company and you're building up a leader. You need to acquire the talent yourself. So I'm gonna use sales management as an example in this video, pretty much all the way through, because essentially that's what a lot of clients uh, reach out for us to do in, in terms of building up their own sales managers or growing their sales teams. That's a question I get all the time. So in a sales management example, if you're building up a sales manager and you want to promote that person internally, first, you have to acquire the skill of sales management, right? Otherwise, how are you going to grow that leader internally? Then once you've acquired the skill, the second step is you need to transfer that skill to somebody else. Okay. Pretty simple. Then finally, once that skill is transferred, you really need to develop it right? Because let's say you're a 10 out of 10 sales manager. Even if you really show them how to do it, they're going to be a five or a six out of 10 at first. And then you need to develop them to the point to where they can get to that 10 out of 10. The second way is you can buy the talent, right? So you can acquire it by paying somebody and bringing in somebody in the organization who's just already done it. Then you can transfer to, or the second step still transfer because instead of you transferring that skill to them, they're at least teaching or kind of transferring that skill to you. You're not going to be doing it, but they're gonna be teaching you how it should be done. And then that way you can inspect what you expect, right? And have a clear visibility on what shouldn't be happening in that department. And then you're still gonna be developing that leader. Now, if you're bringing up somebody in house, you're gonna be developing them in a style that has a lot of direction. So telling them kind of like exactly what to do and has a lot of support in terms of supporting them through challenges, how they're thinking, different stuff like that. Now, if you bring in somebody who already knows the skill, you're not really gonna be directing on what to do, but you still need to develop them in the sense where you need to support them emotionally in terms of the challenges they're gonna run into, help them with their thinking, and really be there to serve them and make their job as easy as possible. That's really what you wanna do as a servant leader. This training is gonna talk about not the second way, how to buy the talent, but more so how to do the first way which is how to essentially bring it up in house, okay? So again, that's three steps. It's acquire, transfer, and develop. We're gonna start with acquire, and like I said, we're gonna do it in a sales management example, okay? So if you're gonna develop a leader within your organization, first, you gotta learn the skill, okay? So if you need a good sales manager, you gotta learn sales management. If you need a good client success director, you gotta learn how to run your client success team, okay? Pretty simple. Now. How good do you need to get at this? My always thought is you need to be 20% better than the next person you're gonna expect if, if you're bringing it up in-house. Now, this isn't necessarily like you have to do this, but this is my rule of thumb. So for instance, if I was selling and I wanted to hire a sales rep, I would wanna be closing at 30%, which is 20% higher than 25% if I know the 25% is my KPI that's gonna allow my sales team to scale. Does that make sense? And then the same thing for sales manager. If I was running the sales team, I wanna be running the sales team. Let's say I need them to close at 25%. I wanna be running it to where they're closing at 30. That way, if I bring up a sales manager and it dips down to 25, 25 is really all I needed in the first place, okay? So I always wanna be kind of 20% better than really what is the minimum KPI expectation, okay? Keep in mind, the better you are at the skill, the better you're going to be, um, you know, so the better sales manager you're going to be, the better you're going to be at developing sales managers. Kind of common sense, but, you know, it really works like that. And again, there's going to be times where it's better to buy the skill, 
right? It's better to just find somebody who's been there and done that. And depending on the industry that you're in, that's going to be harder, easier, depending on your industry. So for instance, my CFO, you know, I did not learn how to be a CFO before I uh, brought in a CFO. I just brought in a CFO. And that person is really just kind of, I've been there to support them through different things, but I've never really given them too, too much direction because they already know what to do. They already have the skill. Okay. So timing, when is the right, right time to offload this to somebody else? Okay. Uh, the most obvious answer is when the work warrants a part or full-time position, or when it's the work has accumulated to such a point to where it's a significant bottleneck on your personal time. So if you were hiring a sales manager, what I mean is if, if you have two sales reps and that's it, you know, it doesn't really warrant a full-time sales manager. Okay. doesn't mean you couldn't bring one in if you feel like that's a huge bottleneck on your time, but it doesn't really warrant a full-time sales manager. Now, if you have six, it definitely warrants a full-time sales manager. Okay. You know, again, if, if you want to offload it sooner than later, that's fine. That's a personal decision, but you got to know that, okay, I'm willing to eat the fixed cost of management and that tacking down my gross margin a little bit earlier in order to get back my time, right? That's truly up to you. Now, the six plus uh, direct report rule. So you probably heard Jeff Bezos said, if a team's too big to share two pizzas and the two pizza roll, then it's too big, right? If they can't sit around a table and share two pizzas, it's too big of a team. Once you get really kind of above six direct reports, it's good to have a manager in that team. And then generally a manager can handle up to my experience, six to eight, uh, and some teams 10 to 12, depending on the team. Okay. And depending on how much energy needs to go into those individual teammates. Okay. Step two is transfer. All right. So what we do is we use a volume knob approach opposed to a light switch, right? So a light switch would be, you know, you decide somebody's going to be the sales manager. All of a sudden they're taking all the meetings and doing everything. They run everything themselves. And the team goes from you running it one day to them running it one day right? So where you're making an announcement, okay, hey, so-and-so is the manager. All right, see ya. That typically, I'm not saying that can't work, but that's not the way I like to do it. And in my opinion, uh, there's a much, much better way. And so we use what's called a volume knob approach, right? So it's more, much, much more gradual. And so what we do is we start with the person being a player coach, and then that's kind of our test to see if they could do it in the first place. And then we slowly transition that person to sales manager. Okay. It's much, much easier that way. And so because of this, the transfer step, stage two, I look at it in two steps, player coach, and then the full-time transition. So step one is player coach. This is again, just a test that what you would do here is you reduce their KPI by 70 to 80%, then compensate them with a small base so they don't have a drop in income. All right. So I'll give you an example. And again, um, I'm going to use some random numbers here and I'm also going to use sales, right? So let's say you have a salesperson, they're making 10 K a month and that's pretty regular on your sales team and they're perfectly at KPI. So you would reduce, let's say, their KPI by 20%, so they would technically probably make 8K a month, and then that you would give them a 2K a month base, and that 2K a month is for a set amount of management activities, okay? Now, I'm not saying your salesperson should be making 10K a month or you know more than that or less than that. I'm just giving you an example to make math really easy. And I typically like reducing it by, by 20 to 30% or um, yeah, so I had this wrong here. It's not reduced by 70 to 80. It's reduced by 20 to 30. So they're at 70 to 80% of KPI. Okay. That frees up time for them to do some player coach activities. Now, very, very key with player coach, especially if you're developing somebody who's never done this before, you have to be extremely definitive of what exactly those activities are. So you can't just say, Hey, the team needs to perform at this level, a quantitative, quantitative KPI and then just be like, go figure it out. Now you can more so do that type of stuff when you're buying a leader who already has the skill, but you can't really do that if you're developing somebody internally. So what you gotta do is you gotta give them exact responsibilities. Now, the other thing about this is most newbie leaders, okay? Most people who are new to management, they think that management is more, okay, yeah, running the meetings and stuff like this, but it's more projects and developing new dashboards and tracking and all of this stuff and getting credit and recognition for it. That's not true. Most of the reality in, in the position of a manager is giving credit to everybody else, being completely self, selfless, being a uh, servant leader, and really doing QC, doing quality control. That's like 80% of your day. So if you're a sales manager, really the 80% of your day is just watching calls, okay? Or it's training up reps based on the calls you watched. That's it, literally it. And it's giving them all the recognition when the team wins. 
So um, a great book to read about that is called The Motive by Patrick Lencioni. Um, That is a big, big misconception. And because quality control is such boring work, people tend to avoid it, right? So for your player coach, you might say, hey, all we're gonna do at first is you're gonna run one meeting a week and I'm gonna review it, give you feedback every single time. You're gonna do 10 call reviews a week total. You're gonna do one training per day with one rep. So that's five trainings a week. That would be about five hours of your week. And you're gonna do an end of week report on every single rep where you think they're at qualitatively and quantitatively, as well as a synopsis of kind of how you're feeling about the team and how you're feeling about your role. Step one, the player coach, okay, is a 30 to 90 day test to see if the person has what it takes to be a sales manager. And in sales specifically, let me just say this, player coaches tend to stink, okay? I just personally would have your expectation that you're still gonna have to do pretty much everything and they're just gonna kind of be there as a helper, all right? The issue with player coaches in sales is that you're kind of balancing as a player coach completely selfish activities versus completely selfless activities. On top of that, sales is something to where there's no end to where you can do it. You know, like if you're in client success, there's only so much you can really do. Uh, With sales, you could always make more prospecting calls. You could always do more follow-ups. You could always take more calls in a day. So because of that, it's a hard thing to balance. And then finally, because it's such a performance-based position, if you have your player coach who really now is viewing themselves as a leader on the team, well, if they're behind on their KPI, what do you think they're going to prioritize? Selling, which is the majority of their money is coming from, or the coaching, right? They're most likely going to prioritize the selling. And a lot of that can be good intention because they want to lead by example. But at the end of the day, the coaching is not really getting done. So just don't have too high, high expectations of that. And what I have found is sales is just really not an effective player coach system. So we only view it as like a test. Now, any other department, any other role, I found player coaches can be something to where somebody can just gradually ramp their KPI down and then increase the amount of direct reports they have. Like client success, we have a very, very successful client success director. And this person, you know, at first just freed up like 20% of their time and they were 80% KPI. Then they were kind of 50-50. And it's just sort of as the direct reports and responsibilities increased, they just kind of gradually went down and they did great the entire time to where the point to where now they have 10 direct reports, now they don't have any actual clients they're uh, they're, they're servicing and they're just full-time manager, but they have so much experience and so much leeway and time to sort of ease into that position. And that tends to work really, really well. With sales, kind of a little bit of, uh, how do you say it, like a uh, anomaly in terms of the player coach, in my experience, not working too well. In most other departments, it's completely fine. Hey guys, we'll get back to the content in a second, but I have a quick favor to ask. We don't run any ads or really do a lot of promotions on this channel at all, but the one thing that would really help us out if you're getting value from this is if you could share it on your socials. So specifically sharing it on your Instagram story through a screenshot or just pressing share and really sharing it on any platform. The main way we plan to grow this isn't through ads, it's through word of mouth. So if you're getting value, that's the one thing you could do. Make sure you tag me on Instagram at Cole Thomas Gordon. And with that said, back to the content. So. Transfer part two is getting this person to be a full-time manager. So the limiting belief here is, especially with sales, that, oh my God, this person's my best salesperson. I want them to do everything. I want to eat my cake or have my cake and eat it too, whatever. You know, you want the production from your top rep and you want them to manage the whole entire team and you don't want to do any of it, right? This is a big fallacy and I highly recommend not falling in this limiting belief. The truth is, if you do not move this person up, you may never create the space for people to come up within the organization beneath them to be able to be successful. And you're not gonna create the space and bandwidth for that best rep to actually put all their energy and full time into coaching the team. So even if you're like, man, my player coach is like producing all my sales, you gotta bite the bullet in the short term, have that short term pain to go back to that long term pleasure. Worst case, in a month or two, if you really, really can't figure it out, you move that person back to sales. But it's worth it to try to get a good leader on your team. The other thing I want to say about, you know, sales and just really any leaders and specifically, but just because you have the best player doesn't always mean they're going to be the best coach, right? Like Michael Jordan might not be the best coach, but he was the best player. Okay. And a lot of the best coaches aren't the best players. Now, generally what I found, it can go hand in hand. A lot of times you just want to make sure your player is not a lone wolf type, like the Kobe Bryant type that's sort of in their zone, in their thing, they crush it, but they're not necessarily the best team player or they're not the best you know they're not the best at really having awareness around the team and really caring about the team they're not associated with mission vision and values maybe as other team members so in instances like that it might have somebody better who's maybe 
the second or third best player, but has that better coaching sort of character traits and beliefs and skill sets and so on and so forth. So just keep that in mind. So what does the compensation look like for the full-time manager? Okay. So again, let's say your salesperson is making 10K a month. My general rule of thumb with sales managers, and this really goes for any position, is you want them to make slightly less but with their new comp structure, they're gonna have more upside and more downside. So example would be, let's say their comp before was 10K a month. So let's say we wanna give them 60% variable, 40% fixed. So we give them a 4K a month base, and then we give them 6K a month variable, and we split that into five tiers of 1,200. So if they hit 90% of their KPI, like the team KPI, they get 1,200. 95% of the team KPI, they get another 1,200. 100%, another 1,200. 105, another tier. 110, another tier. And then you can slowly move this tier up and you can even move their base up and their variable up over time, especially as the team grows. But this would essentially reset every 30 days. Now, what I would do is I would do something like this first to just kind of get a feel for it. And then eventually when you know you have the right person who you really love long-term and you're like, man, this is the person, then what I would do is I would probably move them to profit share, especially if this is gonna be the, the main sales director of your entire company moving forward. Like they're, they're gonna be your top dog, your top person. But anybody below that, I would usually do this. And this is how I like to start people off. Now, again, I'm not saying that your sales manager should make 10K a month. Most times in most organizations, most industries, they're gonna make more than that. I'm just staying with 10K a month as an example, just for easy math, okay? So again, let's say your team projection is 50 units. 90% of this would be 45 units. If they only hit 45 units, they would only get one tier. 95% would be two tiers. So they get 1200 times two. Okay. So that's how that would look. All right. And to be honest, this is kind of, this should be a little bit higher because what I like to do is the hundred percent projection. I would want to get them at 10 K. And then if they hit 105 or 120, they would make more than 10. Okay. This, this makes it so it, it ends to where if they hit 110, they could make exactly as much as sales. So this needs bumped up a little bit, right? So it might be about 2K, yeah. So this should be, I'll pause the video. Okay, so this is actually what it should look like, sorry, is if they hit 100%, then they can hit, their they can hit 10K a month, that's 6K variable, then obviously they have, they're able to do more. And you know, if, if you kind of have a lot of fluctuations in your company, this might not work at first, or what you might have to do is do a higher base. Because let's say like, you're really up and down. Like some months you crush it, some months like you're you're dropping below this 90%. Then, you know, you might have a 6K a month or 7K a month base and the variable is a lot more smaller, right? That way, if they miss 90%, they're not making, you know, 40% of what they used to make, if that makes sense. Cool. So we'll move on. Responsibilities of a full-time manager. Again, in one word, QC, okay? And they're gonna avoid doing the boring work. They're gonna avoid doing QC. So here's an example responsibilities of what their day might look like. Like let's say they have an eight hour work day. Obviously they're gonna have the daily meeting. That's gonna be an hour a day. Now, the last thing you wanna give away out of any department, if you're running the department, is the team meeting. Because the team meeting is the cornerstone of the team and kind of acts as the guardrails to make sure the team doesn't fall off base. Because you can almost give them everything else, but if you're just running that one daily meeting, everything will usually stay intact pretty well. Okay, it's when you start delegating that meeting when things can kind of fall off the rails a little bit. So what I do is I give them one meeting to start. And then again, volume knob, I slowly, okay, now you have two meetings a week. Now you're doing three, I'll do two. And now you do four, I'll just do, I'll just show up on Mondays and watch you run it. And then you're just not on it at all. Okay, like at this point, I haven't been on a sales meeting in like a year. Again, that is very, very, very key. And the framework for this meeting, we talk way more about this in our programs, but is wins, projections, then call reviews. Wins, we share client wins. And then, and that gets the team pumped up, builds certainty in the product, all of that stuff. Projections, we go over their KPI. So all the sales reps very quickly say, I'm projecting this for the month, this for the week. Here's where I'm at for the month. Here's where I'm at for the week. I'm on pace. Here's why I'm on pace. Or if they're not on pace, why are they not on pace? And then a lot of times there's a lot of on the spot, spot coaching there. I don't have, you know, if you, there's other trainings on the YouTube channel and in our programs that go over how to do projections. And then in terms of call reviews, what we'll do is every time for about 40 minutes, we'll do a series of call reviews to train all the reps, okay? So it's QC right on the call. Now, 50% of what we'll do, we'll try to do good call reviews where we can point out good actions, give praise and celebrate great wins. The other 50% is ones that need improvement where we gotta give feedback, okay? So that's the 80-20 that of the meeting. Then we'll do, uh, then the manager, let's say they do an hour, uh, their first hour is doing that. They have two hours of deep work projects. So if they do got to do any script revisions or anything like that, they can do that here. Then they do QC for two hours, right? Now with their QC, what they can do is they can watch all the sales calls 
I'm, I'm, I'm staying with the sales manager example. If you were a client success director, you would what, be watching onboarding calls, watching client one-on-ones, watch, looking at the client Slack channel, stuff like that. But for the uh, sales manager, you're gonna be watching the calls, recording loom feedback, or sending it to the, the rep. If it's a little bit more feedback, you might just give them a call throughout the day when they have a no-show and just give them five to 20 minutes of coaching on the spot. What I recommend is go through them. Like you wanna binge these calls. I usually never watch calls start to finish. I'll watch like 10 minutes, uh, the first 10 minutes and the last 10 minutes at two to three X speed just to get a feel of how the call is. And usually where there's smoke, there's fire. So I'll kind of find one that looks a little, okay, this person's closable, but this so call seems off. I'll go deep on that one. And also when they, they submit their end of day reports, every rep should submit an end of day report detailing all the consults that they had, what was great, what, what needs to improve, what was the result, what were the next steps, et cetera, and where they're at with their KPIs. You should look at those end of day reports, look at ones that seem fishy, that feeds back into your choice of which ones you're gonna QC the next day. But until the team gets really big, you could almost QC everyone if you just fly through it. Then you, let's say you take a break for 30 minutes, then you're gonna have your one-on-ones. We'll cover a process for that later. And then you're gonna QC a little bit more. Then you're gonna check your end of day reports. When the reps submit their end of day reports, you can either just give them feedback right in Slack or you can give them a call and say, okay, here's the things that you need to do, et cetera. I already talked about giving meetings away last. So step three is developing. So now this person's full-time Maybe you're still doing a meeting or two a week, but you really need to develop this person. There's two ways you develop a leader. It's the same way you develop anybody. There's quantitative and qualitative. So quantitative lets you know if there is a problem. Qualitative lets you know why the problem is occurring. And it lets you know if your diagnosis of why you think the problem's occurring is the same as what your, let's say your sales manager told you, okay? Or if they have a blind spot. So you'll see what I mean. So let's go over qualitative here. So you're going to meet with your manager at least once per week for a weekly one-on-one for 30 minutes. Okay. If you have other leaders and executives, you might start to do a weekly or bi-weekly executive team meeting. All right. Your, your sales manager or your leader is going to send you an end of day report. This should be a status on every single one of the direct reports. What's going well with them. If they're on pace for the KPIs, if they're not on pace, why they're not on pace, so on and so forth. It's going to state the team KPIs. If they're not on pace, why they're not on pace, et cetera and their overall thoughts and how they're feeling, what's going on, what's on their mind. On the meetings, which is the one-on-ones, okay? I mean, you could do this on the executive meetings too, but preferably the one-on-ones. What you're gonna wanna do is start by looking at the KPIs and seeing, okay, are we on pace for weekly? If we're, are we on pace for monthly? If we're not on pace, why are we not on pace? And if they're not on pace, you're gonna ask them, okay, why are we not on pace? Does their diagnosis seem accurate when they tell you? Do they know why they're not on pace? Are they taking responsibility? Do they have clear next steps? Especially at the leader level, you should never have somebody show up where they're behind KPI and they don't know why, right? I always say, there's no shame in not hitting your numbers. There's only shame in not knowing why, okay? So again, framework for one-on-ones, we already covered KPI that's above. After we go through the KPIs, we'll check out Asana and just look at any projects that they have outstanding that they need to do. Then we'll talk about anything that I wanna talk about this week that I just noted, like I'll note certain things, that, okay, I'll cover this on the one-on-one. Then we'll go over any questions or things that they wanna cover. Then we'll look at the status of their team. So how's the team doing? Did anybody quit? If so, why did they quit? Okay, if there's new people coming on, do we need to bring new people on, stuff like that. And then we'll do basic temp checks. Like, how are you feeling? Are you having fun? Are you excited? Are you struggling? Okay, where are you struggling? Different stuff like that. Like I emotionally always wanna see where they're at, what's their vision like, if they feel like they're excited for the future, do they know where they're going? Do they feel like they're, they're driven? Is their necessity high? Do they have a clear vision of what they want to ex- succeed within the company for themselves and also a personal vision outside of that? Like I'll look at basic stuff like, are they getting enough sleep? Like, are they drinking enough water? Are they taking care of their health? Things like that. Uh, all of that stuff is uh, very, very important. So we want to kind of make a personal connection on these and see where they're at there as well. So qualitatively, so the biggest issue with any manager is that they're gonna have blind spots, right? They're gonna make the wrong diagnoses of why the team's not on pace. They're gonna make the wrong diagnoses of why people on their team quit. They're gonna make the wrong diagnoses of why certain people are performing and why certain people aren't, or why maybe some people aren't respecting them at the level that they need to respect them, things like that, right? So how do you see if their diagnosis is correct? How do you see what blind spots they have You have to do it through QC, okay? Quality control, right? And preferably QCing their QC. So you gotta review their sales meetings and see if their sales meetings are good. What feedback do you have on those? Review their one-on-ones with the team. Review their interviews. 
Now, at first, you should obviously be doing a final interview before you hire anybody on the team, especially if you're the CEO, you're bringing up a sales manager. Eventually, they could do it all themselves, but you also review their interviews, see how those are going, okay? See what people are showing up to those interviews, see how they're handling those interviews, see if, okay, maybe they did 10 interviews in a week, you review them all, and you're like, man, I feel like you picked the wrong person, okay? Feedback, right? Or now, that's kind of a review at the managerial level. You also want to review at the front lines level. So you review their sales team's calls and their prospecting calls, or let's say their setters, and you want to see what's going on with that, right? Remember, their t if they're a sales manager, their team's performance on a qualitative level, obviously a quantitative level as well, but a qualitative level is a direct reflection of them, okay? So the easiest way to see how they're doing is to check out their team's doing, right? Not talk to them, check out their team's doing, right? You also want to identify a problem call. Like let's say you're, you're QCing some of the sales team's calls and you identify a problem call well, just send it over to the sales manager. Say, hey, I found this call. I was listening to it. I had some feedback, but I just want to see what you think. Will you watch this and send me back your feedback? Then have them watch it. They send you their feedback. And let's see if their feedback's accurate or if their feedback's off from the basic things you saw. That's a coaching opportunity. And yes, this means that even still as, let's say, the, the, you're the CEO and then there's the sales manager, until that person gets really humming along, and you really trust them, especially the beginning phases, you need to still review some of the sales team's calls. Now, nowhere near maybe what you used to have to do when you were managing the team full-time, but still, you probably need to do about 20% of what you used to be doing, okay? Because that's the easiest way to see how your manager is doing. So as recap, developing managers is a volume knob, not a light switch. Start with a player coach, use that as a test. Other positions, player coaches last much more long-term than sales. The quality of your company is the quality of what's happening on the front lines. It's the ads, the copy, the setter calls, the closer calls, the onboarding calls, the one-on-one -on -one calls with the team, your group coaching calls, stuff like that. Any customer interfacing thing in your company is the quality of your company. And that's a direct reflection of what's happening there of the managers who lead them. Bad managers, they're gonna do a bunch of new projects, get a, try to get a bunch of credit and recognition. Good managers put their head down, do the boring work, which is QC, okay? Then they give all the recognition away. Your manager's uh, performance is a direct reflection of what you see on the front lines. We already talked about that. There's two ways to go over that. There's quantitative, there's qualitative. We talked about that. And remember, you're in a pursuit of an accurate diagnosis and also getting your manager to have that accurate diagnosis as well. Once your manager has the ability to be able to listen to a call and basically be able to diagnose exactly what's wrong the same way you have, now you have somebody who can be much more relatively autonomous and you don't have to be hands-on. Hopefully this training helped guys. We'll see you in the next video.